Uh, hello everyone, I'm Charlotte and I just started my PhD at the University of Antwerp uh, at Biomina and today I will be talking to you about some of the work I did during my master's thesis in the last couple of weeks. Uh, next. <laughs> um, yeah, proteins are, play a central role in many cellular processes and for these uh, cellular functions they often have to interact with each other. Uh, new viruses, I, viruses like the new coronavirus, um, have a small genome and a limited number of proteins to work with, which is why they often uh, heavily rely on their interactions with their host proteins um, for basic functions, such as um, just like replication and survival. So for example, uh, the SARS-CoV-2S protein needs to interact with two human proteins in order to, uh, for SARS-CoV-2 to enter the cell. Um, the S protein needs to bind to ACE2 and needs to be cleaved by TMPR-SS2 in order to, for the uh, membranes to fuse and for the uh, RNA genome to enter the human cell. Without these two interactions with the human proteins, SARS-CoV-2 wouldn't be able to enter the cell. So um, by studying protein-protein interactions between virus proteins and human proteins, we can discover these types of uh, mechanisms and uh, these are interesting places to intervene. And this is where drug repurposing comes into play because uh, a lot of established drugs already exist that target human proteins. For example, camostat mesylate um, is a inhibitor of TMPR-SS2. And if we use that uh, apart, um, the SARS-CoV-2 infection could be partially blocked. Even, uh, however, even with uh, drug repurposing, you still need to test whether the new function of the drug um, really works, uh, I mean, the new context. Um, but it will be a lot faster than creating a new drug against a new virus. I can give the next slide, thank you. Um, so Gordon et al. Uh, performed a study to um, figure out targets for drug repurposing by creating a sort of blueprint of all of the human proteins that SARS-CoV-2 needs um, to infect human uh, cells. Uh, they did this by performing affinity purification mass spectrometry on 27 SARS-CoV-2 proteins. Um, you can give the next slide. Um, yeah, so using this technique, uh, it's a very commonly used technique to uh, study protein interactions. They, um, uh, it's a technique in which a bait, in this case, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 proteins um, are tagged and expressed in cells. And then um, all of the proteins in the cell uh, can interact with those baits. Uh, after cell lysis, uh, the baits are captured by uh, using the tag and then all of the proteins that don't interact with the bait will be removed. Um, all of the uh, baits and the proteins that interacted with it can be extracted from the column by cleaving the tag and those proteins can then be digested into peptides that can be detected by using mass spectrometry. Uh, Gordon et al. performed this on 27 of the SARS-CoV-2 proteins and they were able to identify, uh, I think, 322 uh, pro uh, human proteins with which SARS-CoV-2 interacted and used these proteins to look for drugs that are targeting these proteins. Um, so, yeah, you can give the next slide. Um, the, every peptide that we detect using mass spectrometry will give us a spectrum and this spectrum then needs to be, um, the first step then in the analysis will be to identify the spectrum. So figure out from which peptide the spectrum originated. And uh, this is often done by, uh, this is done by using a search engine. And uh, you have to, um, the search engine then needs a reference database uh, to which this uh, observed spectrum needs to be matched to a spectrum from your reference database. This reference database can either contain theoretical spectra uh, that are originated from the sequence database, or it can contain um, uh, a spectral library of uh, experimental spectra that have been identified already. 
Um, a problem that can occur is that uh, proteins, and I, something that you need to keep in mind, is that proteins can be modified. Um, in the cell, they can be um, phosphorylated or ubiquitinated, and um, the resulting peptides can then have a sort of mass shift inside the spectrum. And when such a mass shift occurs, because the masses don't really um, line up, then uh, the spectrum wouldn't be able to be matched to the spectrum in the library, in the reference library. Uh, there are two ways to solve this. You can either um, specify these specific modifications or you can allow this mass shift to occur. Uh, you can go on to the next. Um, yeah, so Gordon et al. Uh, use standard sequence database searching in which um, you specify the modifications. So for each modification that you specify in the theoretical spectra, um, both the modified and unmodified version of the spectrum will be present so that if your observed spectrum is modified, you will be perfectly able to match it to the spectrum in your library and you will find out that it's that specific peptide containing that specific modification. Um, however, uh, for each modification that you add, uh, that you want to consider in your analysis, um, all of the versions of that modification need to be present in your reference database. Um, this will increase your search pace drastically um, and can cause your like, computer to explode, um, is what they can say. Um, so this is why you're very limited in the amount of modifications that you can select. And uh, that is why often artificial modifications are picked, uh, which are caused by sample processing, because a lot of the peptides in your sample will have those types of modifications, like, for example, the oxidation of methionine. And otherwise, a lot of your identifications will get lost. An alternative is open modification searching in which um, you allow the masses of your spectrum to have like a shift. So you allow a very wide mass shift. And in this way, you implicitly consider any type of modification because a, a modified spectrum will be able to match against its unmodified variant. Uh, like I said, uh, the original uh, results were analyzed using uh, standard sequence database searching. They specifically use MaxQuant. And we, we reanalyzed that data using uh, Ansolo to perform open modification searching. Okay, so after uh, the proteins that are identified, um, the protein interactions need to be filtered in order to create a protein-protein interaction network. Um, we use the different method to identify the proteins, but we did use a very similar protein-protein interaction filtering method. And um, because of the technique we use, we were also able to investigate modifications. In the original analysis, only two modifications were um, uh, considered, and those were both artificial modifications. So they aren't that interesting to study further, but we were able to investigate a lot of interesting modifications and uh, we could enrich our protein interaction network with those modifications. So um, by uh, because we um, use the diff we were able to uh, implicitly consider every type of modification, we were able to identify a lot more um, spectra, uh, which resulted in us being able to identify a lot more protein ex interactions as well. We were also able to reproduce 65.2% of the original results, and uh, we could further investigate biologically relevant uh, modifications. Mm. Okay. Um, <laughs> so in this slide, you see uh, the number of uh, peptide spectra that we could match to peptides, so peptide spectrum matches, PSMs. Um, and uh, I use a different color code for uh, peptides that were modified versus uh, peptides that weren't modified um, or spectra. And um, as you can see, in, uh, it's one bait like NSP13 
Um, the light green color is all of the uh, unmodified spectra that uh, the original, uh, that Gordon et al. were able to um, identify. Um, as you can see, only like a very small part of their spectra were modified. And when you look at our reanalysis of the same data, uh, we can identify almost the same amount of unmodified spectra, but we were able to identify a lot more modified spectra, which allowed us to also identify a lot more uh, protein interactions for that specific bait. <laughs> Uh, with the type of data analysis that we did, uh, we were also able to um, investigate very uh, interesting modifications in specific um, uh, spectra. So, for example, um, the phosphorylation of the N protein of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, the N protein, like other SARS-CoV-2 proteins, were expressed as a bait. And uh, here you can see around it all of the human proteins that it interacted with. The, um, like, green, <laughs> like the... A uh, bright green color of overlap um, uh, shows the uh, interactions that we were able to reproduce. And one of those interactions was its interaction with uh, CSK, CSNK2A, um, which is a catalytic subunit of CK2. And in addition, we were also able to identify an interaction with uh, CSNK2A3, um, which is also probably probable uh, catalytic subunit of CK2. Uh, CK2 is a kinase, and uh, we thought it would be interesting to look at, um, to see whether there are spectra that were matched to the N protein um, that contained phosphorylation. And we found a couple of spectra um, that did. So um, we used a tool to look at the spectra and see whether we can uh, pinpoint the modification. So when you go to the next slide, um, you see here a visualization of the spectrum. And above you can see that at the end, um, you can see like the spectra has shifted and this is where the phosphorylation occurred. So the mass is larger because at that part of the peptide, the phosphorylation is present. Um, and it could be located to one specific serine. Um, and this same serine uh, was predicted to be a phosphorylation site of CK2, the kinase that was also found to interact with the protein. Um, when you look at the next slide, you can see that um, the same phosphorylation site was also um, identified by Davidson et al. and uh, Klan et al., which were two independent studies that were specifically investigating uh, the phosphorylation of SARS-CoV-2 proteins. Uh, personally, I find it very interesting that we were able to um, find these results because um, it's interesting. Uh, you should note that uh, these two studies specifically um, studied the phosphorylation of N proteins. And for information about with which kind of kinases the N protein interacted, they had to look at the results by Gordon et al. And um, Gordon et al. weren't, uh, because they didn't look at phosphorylations, they weren't able to find this specific phosphorylation. Whereas we, with just one data set and reanalysis, we were able to find the interaction and find the modification and its location, which is quite powerful. I think. Um, so to conclude, uh, which is the next slide, um, I want. I hope that after this presentation, you all really see the value of um, reprocessing existing data, because um, when we are a by doing so, we were able to extract new knowledge. Um, with considering any type of modification, we were able to identify 99, 90% uh, 90 more high confidence protein interactions and uh, perform the first investigation of modifications in um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus intractome. Uh, I want to thank you all for listening. And I also want to uh, thank my um, both promoters, which are Wout Pitrimieux and uh, Professor Dr. Chris Laukes. Thank you for your attention. Great. Thank you very much for this presentation. Very interesting. I think uh, so we have a few questions. Um, okay. If the audience has, uh, has, has also questions, don't hesitate to ask them in the question tab. So the first question is from Chong. How can you have, how can you have the identified peptides, PSMs, 
having less false positive results after searching against the database? Um, uh, yeah. I don't know if you get the question. Um, I don't, uh, I'm, I'm reading it also. Uh, okay. <laughs> how can you have the other, having less false positive results after searching against the database? Um, we used uh, um, a false discovery rate, um, and it was 1%, uh, like the original analysis. Um, it's, uh, there's always in that, I didn't mention it because it's, um, like, uh, but it, uh, there's always like a decoy uh, data um, base that is used as well. And um, if a spectrum matches to a decoy, um, then uh, like that is like registered. And once it's like 1%, then the analysis stops. Um, to, yeah, and that's also the reason why only a couple of uh, modifications can be chosen because um, once you, I mean, using standard sequence database searching, because once you add too many modifications, your search space will be so big that um, you will get a lot of false positives and your search will stop very quickly, which, um, and your sensitivity will go down. Okay, okay, great. Uh, and then Nicolina asked you also, um, did you also look at other PTMs, such as glycosylation, presuming they're important in the membrane lo located interaction? Also, do you think finding protein subpopulations with different PTMs patterns would be relevant using, for instance, top-down approaches? Um, yeah, so to answer the first question, uh, affinity purification mass spectrometry isn't really the best type of data to use for membrane-located interactions um, because, uh, yeah, it's... A better technique would be bio-ID. Um, there are a lot of, those are really two complementary techniques. Um, so if we would, I, I think like isolation is definitely an important uh, modification to look at. Um, and we did, um, but we are still working on those results. Uh, but when you really want to look at them in a membrane, membrane located interaction, then uh, it would be more interesting to reanalyze the results from BioID because they get to see a lot more of the interactions that were also happening at the membrane level. You can see that um, like the SARS-CoV proteins that are located more at membrane places that they that with BioID they were able to identify a lot more interactions than that they were with affinity purification mass spectrometry. Okay, great. Okay. Um, but I think it's, uh, it's time uh, ah, to, okay. uh, to this. Well, I mean, yeah. Or, or you want to, to have a last, add the last comment or? Uh, no, no, it's fine. Okay. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you very much for, for this very interesting talk.